and welcome to the Art of Crime. Apologies that this is the earliest this is getting out. I know I should have podcast uh, last week, but unfortunately, when you're an artist, you come through bits of busyness and quietness, and last week was super, super busy. Um, it's all good, it's all good. Commissions are all completed that I had uh, scheduled to be done, and I've even managed to finish my Forza Charm bird piece that I've been working on recently. I'll pop a picture in so you can see which one that is. Um, but I am back, massive apologies for missing last week, and this week we're going to be talking about one that I'm a little bit unsure of, I'm not certain how I feel, I'm very on the fence with this one, um, very uneasy contexts and things like that to talk through, uh, so trigger warning for you guys out there, there is going to be references to um, child abuse and um, sexual exploitation of children, um, just very very I can't say minimal, but it, it, it is mentioned. I'm not going to be going into graphic details though. So just in case that is a trigger warning for you, um, don't watch this one if it is that you are easily triggered by it. Um, so today we are going to be talking about Egon Scheele. Now, Scheele was born on the 12th of June in 1890, around 18 miles away from Vienna in Austria in a place called Tullen. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that Right, apologies if I am not, uh, but he was born to his parents, Adolf and Marie. His father, Adolf, was a station master and unsurprisingly, as Egan Schill was growing up, he became fascinated with trains, so much so that he would go with his father to the station, he would sit and draw the trains. Um, that was probably one of his earliest influences for his drawings. Now, I'm not sure if it's the same way you live, but when kids are growing up, they aspire to be things that their parents are. Um, sometimes they would, in Egon Schill's position, aspire to be a station master or take up that fascination in trains, which Egon clearly did with the drawings. However, in our instances, if there were family that were nurses, for instance, you may wish to be a nurse as you grow up. It was, it's kind of, back then, especially in the 1800s, it, it was the way things were. Whatever your parents were, that's what you effectively became. So if your father was a station master, your father would expect, especially the eldest male in the family, to become the station master as well, sort of follow, follow on the family tradition um, in business, basically. However, his father got quite frustrated at the fact that Egon was constantly focusing on his drawings, the drawings of the train, not the actual runnings of the station. So much so that it got to the point that Egon Schill's father actually destroyed all of his drawings that his son had created, which must have been devastating. They lived in Tolland until Scheel was 11 years old, and then basically the family moved to the city of Krem, where Scheel began secondary school at the local gymnasium. As Scheel was at school, he was actually seen as quite a strange child, a bit of a loner, a bit peculiar, potentially shy and quiet, which could be put down to the fact he was so lonely. He he kept himself to himself pretty much most of the time. And something that I can relate to with Shiel is the fact that he didn't excel so much in the academic side of things. Um, not that I was terrible at school, um, far from it, I, I still passed, but I, I can relate to the fact that he excelled much more in the hands-on stuff, so for him in particular, it was his gym, his athletics and his artwork. Not so much the athletics for me. And it was these two exceptions, his athletics and his drawings, that basically kept Shiel going through secondary school. And because of Shiel's lack of interest in his schooling, so he basically just wasn't interested in it, and because there wasn't that interest there, he didn't excel and he didn't learn anything, uh, to put it bluntly. He pretty much kept the same skill set level academically throughout many years of uh, his schooling. And I, even though he had different tutors, he even tried different school gymnasiums, so different um, secondary schools throughout Krem to see if he could actually excel any better, whether it was the teachers at fault or whether it was the fact that just Shield just didn't want to learn. And it was because of this he ended up actually being kept back quite a few years in school to try and catch up. Now, I'm not sure if this is something that happens that much in the UK. I've never experienced it in school or, or been in a class 
where it has happened. I'm assuming that it probably could happen. But I know that further afield, I know it for definitely it happens in America. And from the looks of this, obviously, it does happen in Austria as well. When they actually keep the child back to kind of get them up to the level that they should be before they move on. Which I actually kind of understand that. It makes sense. And him being kept back this uh, amount of time basically meant that by the time she was 14, he was actually two or three years older than all the other peers in his class. So he was a good few developmental years above the other children and this just didn't help him at all and what probably made this 10 times worse is that actually Adolf's father at the age of 14 passed away from syphilis. Now because of the cause of death for Shield's father Adolf, the syphilis, it actually created quite a shift in the dynamics of the family. Especially being as though as around those sort of times, syphilis was seen as something that was spread amongst prostitutes, that sort of thing. Now, this isn't me saying that Adolf's father had it. There are other ways of getting and catching the disease. However, this basically meant that rumours spread and it meant that the family pretty much took a hit socially. Not only did the family take a hit socially, they actually took a massive hit financially because Adolf was the breadwinner of the family. This meant that Marie, Shield's mother, actually had to seek financial help from wealthy family members and wealthier families in general who were friends with the, with the Shields. One family member in particular, a brother-in-law that helped out a lot, was Leopold. Now, Leopold actually stepped up and became the guardian or second guardian to all of the Shields' children. In particular the two youngest children who actually still required guardianship that was Egon and his sister Gertrude now obviously back then the males were seen as the breadwinners of the family and it kind of meant that Egon was now the man of the house he had to step up and it was because of this that the other family members actually encouraged Marie to steer Egon away from the drawings at this point he was extremely gifted in the drawings he was creating and that's what he wanted to do he knew that's what he wanted to do however it wasn't going to bring in the money unfortunately artists back then as of now unless you're in the right circles it can be extremely hard to get your stuff seen and as awful as it sounds these artistic ambitions that he had his family actually saw as quite selfish given the predicament his mother was now in and the fact that they believed he should be stepping up as the man of the house now to take care of the family. And the fact that he was still adamant that he wanted to head for these ambitions kind of meant that he had to give up on his dream, which he wouldn't have been happy with. Shields schooling actually took a massive turn for the worse. At this point, he'd been kept back for multiple years. He wasn't progressing any better. And it was actually at this point that his teacher just basically said, well, we may as well give up. There's, there's no point. Uh, you can try a different school, but we're not going to help you. Which is kind of hard to... I know it was a, a while ago. I know this was back in the 1800s. And there wasn't one-on-one -on -one teaching like there is now for someone who's struggling academically. But yeah, just giving up completely. Kind of didn't have a hope in hell, did he really? And because of this, him actually being asked to leave the school... It basically ruled out any job that required academic learning, any university degree, any form of qualification, it point blank ruled it out, which is such a scary similarity to a lot of positions for some people actually still around the world today. I know, especially in the poorer parts of Britain, it is extremely likely that that could happen. And what I would personally hope completely tangent is that now people are realizing that qualifications aren't actually the be all and end all that people are skilled people don't need a tick in a box to say that they are capable of doing the job and i think that's the way that britain seems to be steering the more way to i don't know whether i'm right on that they don't get me wrong they still have a lot of work to do but i would like to think that that is the way we're heading that you don't need a grade to define you and it doesn't you absolutely don't need a grade to define you because they didn't define me at all 
Gilles, however, did not give up on his dream and he actually begged his mother and Leopold to let him go to the brilliant school for art in Vienna, which was the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And they gave in. Eventually they gave in and to his testament and sheer ballsiness, uh, Shiel went forward, he sat an excessive exam to get into this thing. Considering he wasn't academic, he had to pass the bar to be able to attend this school. And he did. In 1906, he passed the sitting for the entrance exam. He got great grades. So much so that he was actually the youngest person to ever be admitted to this school at the age of 16, I believe. Within his first year there, though, at the assistance of many of the people in the school, teachers, uh, fellow artists, things like that, uh, he was actually encouraged to attend a different school. Now, I'm hoping I'm going to pronounce this correctly. <laughs> it was the Academy de Bildenden Kinst. Massive apologies if I haven't pronounced that correctly. My Austrian isn't great. However, he didn't actually manage more than three years at this school because their traditional ways and the way that they taught, it basically frustrated Shiel. But not just Shiel, actually his fellow classmates as well. It wasn't just him that was frustrated with the teaching techniques and what they were learning. And it was actually at this school that he sought out someone who inspired him profusely, the one and only Gustav Klimt. Now, I studied Gustav Klimt in school. Actually, I studied quite a few of his pieces um, in high school and they're beautiful. The colour work, the compositions, he has some amazing pieces. Had I, and I actually remember looking at a couple of Egon Schiele's work because he was, as you'll see a little bit later on, someone who followed in his work styles and was linked very closely to Gustav. Knowing now what I know now, I don't know whether I would have looked at Shield's work the way I did back then. Um, all will be revealed why. But it is very, very uneasy. This is why I like doing these, because it actually questions the person behind the art as well as the artist, because then you interpret the paintings particularly differently. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I actually love knowing all of the facts to be able to then interpret a new way of what they've actually created. But hold that thought for a while when we get back onto the topics of what Shields actually um, completed in his criminal life. It was actually in 1907, so just a year after he'd been at the um, second school, that Gustav Klimt really, really had an influence on Shields' work, and it was completely apparent within the pieces that he was creating. Shield actually became that confident in his work that by 1909 he was strolling around Vienna calling himself the Silver Klimt. Second place Klimt, I'm guessing? I'm not sure, but yeah, the Silver Klimt. However, ever the rebel as Shield was, he just could not deal with the rules and regulations of school and he just didn't thrive in the school environment from what I can gather in my research at all. And one of the terms of the school is that you actually keep everything in-house, so you're not supposed to go and exhibit at different places. Everything is supposed to happen within the school, or the art school in particular itself. But so much so the rebel, he decided to accept an exhibition elsewhere. This was a big no-no. It was completely against the rigid rules of the academy that he was based at. And it all came to a head when Shiel and a few like-minded students, he wasn't alone, actually withdrew from the course in 1909. They actually formed a self-styled new art group between the, the, the few of them that left. Even before Shield turned 20, he had developed his own self-expressionist style. He really knew what he wanted to create with his work. Not only was his work distinctive, you could tell it a mile off, but it was actually gaining traction with people who mattered, even Gustav Klimt himself. Not only that, Klimt's followers of Klimt actually jumped on board the uh, support wagon for Scheel, including the majority of Klimt's Wiener Werkstatt colleagues actually supported Scheel as well, as well as many private collectors took an interest in his work. 
However, all was not rosy in Shield's domain. Klimt had basically programmed Shield to believe that regardless of how good he was, because he was an artist, he therefore deserved the attention, regardless of his work. And he need, he basically made out to Shield that he was entitled to societal support just because he had the name artist as his job title. Again, I know times are different now compared to what they were back then and artists were probably easier to come by back then than now in terms of title and job description. However, I can relate to that in the fact that to try and get past that hobbyist title when people ask me what it is I do and I say I'm an artist you're, sort of, you're kind of expecting them to say no what do you really do for a job not what your hobby is what's your job so I can kind of relate to that a little bit getting past that hobby title is huge and to be recognised as an actual artist it's so hard, but you know what? I've started taking it upon myself now. I am an artist, regardless of what the people think. <laughs> That's just me. That's just me. As Shield developed his style, it actually became much more abrasive than his earlier works and actually much more sexually explicit. And I'm not going to insert any of Shield's explicit images for this particular reason. Not because... Um, there's anything wrong with drawing nudes or anything like that. I will get to the reasons why I'm not popping any in a little bit later. Uh, there's plenty freely available on the internet for you to look at. Um, many of them um, are brilliant pieces of work, but there's a reason I'm not putting them in. Many people actually saw some of his work as frontal assaults on their sitter's vanity, which I can kind of understand. Have a look, that's all I'll say. His works actually eventually annoyed his patrons. He wasn't listening to what they wanted and going down the routes. Again, Shield had his own way and he was adamant that the way he was going to do stuff was his way, which I completely empathise with and understand. He's an artist, he wants to do what he wants to do. Fair dues. However, losing his father, he basically was craving this fatherly devotion that he wanted from his father when he was alive for his work and his patrons weren't giving it him. And I think it was at this point that Shields started to realise that this devotion wasn't gonna be handed on a plate to him. He had to work for it. Because of this, he wasn't getting the attention that he craved as an artist. In 1910, he actually up and moved to Czech Bohemia, where again, his reception <laughs> wasn't what he was expecting, unfortunately. The small village that he moved to, the villagers weren't impressed with his lifestyle, his choices, his unconventional way of living and his bizarre dress sense. But it doesn't bother me at this point. I'm, I'm like, what? There's always that one person that you, you can remember growing up, isn't there, in your area where you live. I don't know whether that's just me. There's always one person. So what if you wore weird clothes? Does it matter? However, he continued and as we know, Shield did lots of nude paintings and things like that and he actually had to leave because a nude model was spotted in his garden and his neighbours did not take kindly to it at all. So he was evicted from his home because there was a nude, art, a nude model in the garden. And it was actually after this point of the eviction that... Shield's life started to spiral, especially when it came to the law. It was actually known that Shield invited children around to his home to pose for him so that he could paint them, treat them as models, that sort of thing. However, seeing some of his paintings, if you were to go and have a look at some of his paintings, you could understand why this may potentially be a huge problem. Children clearly found him admirable they uh, were drawn to him because of the attention he actually gave to other children whether this was because he was getting attention or whether this was because she was giving attention to children that he didn't get as a child or whether he had an ulterior motive he was basically giving these children a lot of attention which 
kids love, don't they? They love attention. And in Shields' behaviour, as we know, he wasn't academically smart and he was held back a few years. So he actually behaved more childlike himself than most adults. So therefore he appealed to the children even more because he behaved like them. Now, looking back from our perspective, it's a little bit different, isn't it? We, we, I don't know whether you guys have alarm bells ringing, whether it's because we're just interested in true crime, but this could actually be seen as predatory behaviour towards children. Don't know whether that's just me, but looking back on what we know now, um, for all predators, they always find that one way in, don't they? And this could be that for Gilles. So much so that his studio actually became the local hangout for school children in the area. After school, the kids would all head over to Igor and Shields' house, where they would hang out, he would do paintings, that sort of thing. He actually also had one of the girls that used his studio as a hangout decide to run away from home, and they act she actually ran away to Egon Shields' home, the studio. She fled her own home, a runaway to his home. Not great, is it? Doesn't look that great. Now, apologies again if I'm getting this girl's name wrong, but her name was Tajana Georgette, and she found refuge with Shiel and his lover at the time. Now, if I had have been Egon Shiel's lover again, time difference, potentially different era, different actions, me being a woman, if a child runs away from home to my home, first place I'm calling is the police, the authority. To let them know I have a runaway in my house. I'm not going to... Obviously I'll welcome her in. But I'm not going to welcome her in and say yeah. I'm not going to tell anyone you're here. It's fine. However, Sheil and his lover Valerie. Uh, forgot to mention her name. Decided they weren't sure what they want, what to do. They weren't sure how to react to this girl turning up and saying she was a runaway. And that she wasn't going home. However, they agreed to take Tashana. Tashana. I hope I'm saying it right to her grandmother's house the following day in Vienna. So not even like the next town. They were going to travel with Tatiana to Vienna to drop her off at her grandmother's house. However, when they arrived in Vienna, which they actually got through quite nicely, they headed to Vienna with Tatiana, she became scared. She actually asked Sheil to take her home. And after three days of being away from her parents, they went home. She was returned to her father, who by this point had rightfully um, logged kidnapping claims for Sheil and Valerie. Of course, that's what you're going to do. These two people have taken your child to a different area. Um, regardless of if you know the full story or not, that's what they actually did. So I can see why he put kidnapping claims in. However, he also put a file claim in for rape too. But I don't know how he got this information that I couldn't quite work it out with the, the there wasn't really much information on this rape charge at all. These charges were eventually dropped and this was because Tajana was actually struggling through her testimony whether this be because she was scared if she was a victim and she was terrified of what she was going to do to her maybe they the whole predator and victim thing had come to a head and he'd influenced her so much that she wasn't going to talk about it and therefore she was too scared to say something or talking from both sides of the coin did she make it up and therefore she was stumbling through what she was trying to say it, it could be either or to be honest um, there wasn't massive information on the details of the case However, I could completely understand why she would stumble through it had she been a victim and was too scared to talk. However, even though the charges were actually withdrawn, this prompted the authorities to actually look into Shield a lot further, especially with all the talks of children being at his home and this charge had actually, after investigation, had brought up more questions. It caused them concern and therefore they decided to look into Shield a little bit further. So a full-scale investigation was set and Shield's studio was actually searched by detectives. 
This search that the police completed actually resulted in one singular image being found and it was actually taped to the wall in Shields' bedroom and it was this particular picture that prompted an arrest. Shield was charged with an account of public immorality. Shield was charged and he was remanded in custody. He spent 24 days in prison because of this image. And although it was only a short stint in prison, it's actually said to be the turning point for Shield um, in his whole life, to be honest. And it allowed him to come to terms with the demands of the society demands of an artist that he can't behave this way if he's going to be an artist. From 1915, he stopped drawing children altogether and split with Valerie. He actually married a lady called Edith Harms. Because of all this time in, World War One actually had a massive impact on Shiel and his life. It's said that Shiel was actually a pacifist and just did not want to fight. He actually was seen to show compassion to Russian soldiers that he was actually in charge of that were in his detention, that he should have been, according to his superiors, vile to. He actually showed them lots of compassion. After Shields' military training, he was stationed in Vienna, and although he was close to home, he could not find time to paint. Let's face it, there was a war going on. It was then that he was relocated three hours away, and his wife was actually allowed to move with him to this new area. However, it was here that their relationship actually deteriorated quite rapidly. His wife was bored, lonely, and Egon said that she complained a lot. And Shiel, again, still couldn't complete his artwork. He was still that focused on completing his commands as a military man that he just didn't have the time to do it. However, after mentioning to his superiors the predicament he was in, he was actually stationed back into Vienna, which helped because he was able to pursue his art again. And I think that helped across the whole board. His wife was back in Vienna. She had people she could speak to. He was given the time to produce the stuff that he loved. She was lucky enough to get his images printed into a book, which bought a abundance of commissions, lots of different types. He was then offered the lead exhibition organiser position, firstly for the Imperial Army Museum, so he could exhibit his own works, and then followed by the succession. And he worked hard, he, he really did work hard to become the artist that he wanted to become. He, he wanted this, he wanted to be known. And it was only after he opened an art school and this art school, again, apologies if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, the Heitzinger Hoopstrauss, apologies if that's wrong, as well as the death of Gustav Klimt himself in that February, February of 1917, that people actually started to pay attention to Scheele. He became widely known as Vienna's foremost artist. Scheele's story end is actually a really sad one, um, a very, very sad one, if I'm honest. When he and his wife finally conceived a child. It was actually at the height of the pandemic. The Spanish influenza can be seen quite close to home now with COVID-19 and we can kind of empathise with what they were going through. Uh, the Spanish flu was a nightmare, especially without the medical treatment that people have today for COVID. Edith was actually in her sixth month of pregnancy when she caught the influenza, which was devastating. And when she caught the Spanish flu, she actually passed away in her six months of pregnancy. And this was just a few days before Shiel himself caught it and passed away too. She and her child passed away on the 28th of October in 1918. This was followed by Shiel on the 31st of October. Now, you might be wondering, Where's the crime? Yes, Shiel had that arrest and he served his time. It wasn't a massive input into this story. However, there was a reason I chose this one and there's a reason I'm on the fence. And that is because if you look at Egon Shiel's work and you know now that a lot of his earlier works were of children, it makes you think. 
Was he a predator? Was he luring these children to be able to draw them to put up on his bedroom wall that the one that they found of the child, which I didn't mention before it was a child, it was just an implement a, a it was just a picture on the wall. It was actually a drawing of a child that was on his wall. So this is why I'm on the fence with this one and I'm not sure how to be react. And it is the reason I'm not putting any of these images in. Yes, I know that he stopped painting children after that particular year. I think it was 1915, I said. So I could pick a picture from that period. I will input his um, self-portraits and things like that. However, I myself am not comfortable in putting up an image that I do not wholeheartedly know isn't of a child because I would not want that to happen to my children. It's a very, very tough one because obviously he shows that he's reformed himself, that he had the pacifist tendencies, but do we know if he actually had the attra attraction to children? I could be being naive and with me not in, with me not including the images it might just be me however I want this to be a safe space and I don't want to include an image that could potentially cause upset people look at art in different ways and as I said I went to school and studied some of his work would I have studied his work as a teenager had I known that I was looking at images of children no but I didn't know because this wasn't readily available when I was a kid and at school studying. It may have been, but because of your school networks, very early days in the internet, it probably wasn't as easy to find as it is today. Had I known this back then, I wouldn't have looked at his work for a minute. But there is no definitive answer as to whether he did or not. So innocence until proven guilty. He was convicted on that one image. However, we can't confirm or deny the other images and where they're from. So for that particular reason, that is the reason I've chosen not to include them. You may think I'm being daft. You may think I'm being stupid. It's artwork. However, I'm not comfortable with it, which is why I was so on the fence with this one. And there is so many different variations of this case. If you were to Google Lee Gong Chill, there are his obviously autobiographies and things like that that you can go. Um, there's lots of different versions. There's lots and lots of different versions. And some actually even suggest that he's done more severe things. Not that that isn't severe, but has continued that theme throughout other areas of his life. Some of these cases even suggest that Shiel's own father was uneasy about Shiel, to the point where he didn't want him to be alone with his younger sister, Gertrude, or Gertie, as she was known by the family. So much so that when his father heard that Shiel and Gertie were locked in a room together, Adolf broke the door down. He did not like the idea of Shiel being in there with his daughter, his sister. So yes, there is hints at potential incest that happened between Shiel and Gertie. However, it's only in a couple of um, instances. I'm not, I'm gonna say take it with a pinch of salt because again, missing files and lack of information and lots of different variations of these stories I'm not happy to say that it was 100% true because you don't know. But it's out there, there is people talking about it. So if you want to go look, it is available. When he actually broke into the room, it turned out they were just developing camera film. So he wasn't in that instance committing any sort of crime at all with Gertie, just to point that out. So yeah, I, I, I am, I feel really uneasy about this one and I'm not too sure what it is I feel uneasy about, if that makes sense. It scares me to know that I may have admired someone's work that could have potentially been a child. I don't know the ins and outs of the images that are available for people to see. I was a huge fan of Gustav Klimt. Uh, growing up, he was someone I actually did a whole project on 
when I was doing A level art. So yeah, I did look at a lot of Egon Shields because he was a massive influence. And when you search for Gustav Klimt, you know, when you search for something and it'll say, you may also like to read Egon Shield is one of the ones that comes up. So like I say, all of the stuff that I've spoken about today, I've just collated from different varying, varying uh, art museums, descriptions and bits from biographies and autobiographies. I'm not sure if it actually was an autobiography, I'll be honest, um, because I couldn't find any name to it. As again, still getting used to this whole research thing. So yeah, I'm still on the fence with this one. He has some brilliant paintings. His self-portraits are phenomenal. And clearly the guy had a gift to be able to get accepted into this school at the age of 16. It's a strange one. Definitely strange. I'd love to know how you guys feel about this one though, because again, like I say, you may sway my thoughts. I would absolutely love to hear what you think. I just, I don't know. Something doesn't sit right with me. And I think it may be the mother instinct in me in allowing, it's, I suppose it's similar to children going and modeling at someone's house these days. You just wouldn't allow them to do it, would you? Because there's too many creeps around. You just wouldn't do it. That's me anyway. I wouldn't allow my daughter to go to someone's house to be painted underage. It may just be me. I may be, um, yeah, I'm really, really uneasy about this one, guys. Sorry. So I know it's not been as in your face crime, so it'd be interesting to know what you think about this one because it's more accusations. I'd love to know what you think of Egon Shiel and what you take from this. Do you think he had the incest with his sister? I don't think he did, to be honest. I think there's just... Yeah, I don't know. I'm torn. I'm torn, guys. But thank you so much for watching again. And I love doing these, so please feel free to drop any hints of the ones that you may like to see. Any tedious link, wel welcome. I love anything that has the tedious link of art and crime. I am looking in and researching into some bigger crimes at the moment, which may end up being two parters because they are huge, but they will be coming soon. I hope to be back again next week on Wednesday. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you do like what you're hearing. If you don't, it's fine. It's still interaction with the page. If you don't like it, let me know. I can change if you let me know what you want. <laughs> So if you would like to support the channel, please feel free to drop us a coffee at my coffee link below. Please feel free to check out my latest works at the website. And if you have any requests, please get in touch and let me know. Thanks again, guys, for watching and I shall see you next week. Bye.